first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I shall not be changed, not chosen, not one of his elect. Dear God, make me as one of thy hired servants, a place to be of use, like Edwina was, not rejected, but strong in Christ. Edwina, Edwina, why did you do it? Such a fearful thing to burn yourself. Alone in hell like the devil. She says Uncle Arthur enjoys his new job and they both like Calcutta, Aunt Fanny. And she says she's very sorry and should she come. You'll have to write again. Yes, that's the last thing I want. Oh, it's for Susan. I think this must be it. It's got a field post office stamp. Yes, it must be. Um, hasn't it? We think so. Here you are, darling. You'll want to take it away. Oh, all right, Uncle. Just one small. Go on, fetch. She's gone to her room. This is from Count Bronowski. Isn't that kind? Put him on B-list, Sarah. We'll give her half an hour, then you must go and see. Mother's washing her hair, and I thought I'd do mine. You don't want the bathroom for ten minutes, do you? Was it a letter about Teddy? Do you want to read it? 
May I? Part of it's about Captain Merrick. Captain Merrick? I can't quite remember. Read it again. Your husband died as a result of wounds having gone forward under orders. With him at the time was Captain Merrick, who, although himself wounded and at risk to his life, rendered the utmost assistance to your husband and stayed with him until the arrival of medical aid. Captain Merrick has now been evacuated to a base hospital and will shortly be transferred to Calcutta for further surgery. It may be of some relief to you to know that he reported that your husband suffered no pain. I've never noticed it before, but there seems to be only one picture of him. Of Teddy? No, of Captain Merrick in the wedding album. That's him, isn't it? It's only half a face. Yes, that's Ronald Merrick. You're sure it's the only one? Perhaps he didn't want his picture taken. Oh, everyone likes their picture taken. He may have thought of it being in the newspapers, the people recognising him as the policeman in the Manners case. Teddy was terribly upset about that. I don't think he ever forgave him. But I must, mustn't I? I'll have to write him a letter. It would be a kind thing to do. I'm not kind. I don't know kind. I don't know anything. I'm relying on you to say what's right and what's wrong. Shall we have a word with Mother about it? I'd rather not. Mother didn't like Teddy. I knew. She didn't really want me to marry anyone until Daddy comes back. She didn't talk to me, you know. Talk to you? About getting married. She made Aunt Fenny do it. I don't think that was right, do you? Was there anything you didn't know? It isn't that. I didn't think about it much. All that was on the other side. The other side of what? What I am now. I seem to have lost the knack of hiding what I really feel. I'm out in the open. Like when you lift a stone and there's something underneath running in circles. Oh, Susan. Perhaps it's better than before. I used to feel like a drawing that anyone who wanted to could come along and rub out. Oh, nonsense. Everyone else seemed so sure. So awfully sure. And I wasn't. I thought if I could make a life for myself, a life like theirs, then no one could come along and rub me out. Marrying Teddy was part of it. The best part. Even though I didn't really love him. Poor Teddy. He walked straight into it. That's why he was so pleased when I wrote and told him about the baby. He married a girl with nothing to her, but having the baby to give to him could have made me something. Who do I give it to now? The baby's yours. It's for you. I suppose the truth is people like us were finished years ago. We know it, but we go on as if we thought we mattered. Why are we finished, Sarah? Why don't we matter? Why we? There's too much about us and we. We may be finished or not matter or whatever it is. But you matter. I matter. Stop thinking like this. You're a person, not a crowd. How self-assured you are. I'm not self-assured at all. But I do know this. You matter. And your baby matters, too. Yes, I know. Everything must be done that can be. That's something I've been meaning to ask. Will you ask Auntie Mabel if she'd lend me the christening clothes? You could ask her yourself. No, they were yours. She will if you ask. Will you be godmother? I shouldn't make a very good one. I don't believe in it. I know. But if anything happened to me, you'd look after the baby, wouldn't you? Nothing's going to happen to you. Of course the baby would be looked after. I think, after all, it would be better if you wrote to Captain Merrick for me. You could thank him so much more kindly. 
make him understand how much the Leightons are beholden to him for what he tried to do for Teddy, whatever it was. Well, if you prefer it. Perhaps he's lying somewhere in Calcutta, feeling it badly, that he was bad luck for Teddy. Last time it was only a stone, but this time... I think I want to know. To find out all about it, because I owe it to Teddy. Captain Merrick will know. Do you think... Do I think what? Do you think it would be nice if we asked Captain Merrick to be godfather? No, I don't. Why not? I don't know. I just don't think it would be. Because of people like Aunt Fenny? Because she says he isn't one of us? No. Aunt Fenny is in Cal now. You could go and see him. You could see Captain Merrick in hospital and that might help. It would help him to get better. He needs something like that. It said surgery in the letter. We don't even know how badly wounded he is. You know, Teddy told me that Captain Merrick never got any letters. Almost never. I think that's why he asked him to be best man. Teddy was upset about the stone, but he had a tender heart. Well, so have you. No. I've no heart at all. I'm not anything. But will you do that for me, Sarah? Will you find out where he is and go and see him? Yes. I'll do that. for a moment, Barbie, but I think it was. I'm told she left her card at Flagstaff House as well for general ranking. So she's on station, I suppose. And she must have left an address. It just said Lady Ethel Manners, Raoul Pindy. Strange. But then it's not so strange. Keeping that child with its dark skin and calling it poverty too. Well, as a Christian, I have to say that child has not been brought to God. Will you tell Captain Merrick about it when you see him in hospital? I might. That's really why I came. I'm leaving for Calcutta in the morning. Was he badly injured? Well, the letter said something about further surgery, so we think he might be. Oh, such an unfortunate young man. He was in love with her, of course, the Manners girl. You'd like to say goodbye to Mabel. I think she's indoors. <laughs> Who is Gillian Waller? Gillian Waller? I don't know. Why? I thought she might be a relation. Mabel keeps mentioning her. In her sleep, of course. I go in, you know, to make sure. She's become so forgetful. The light, her book. She goes to sleep with her spectacles on. One's anxious about accident, a breakage, a splinter. You tuck her up. <laughs> she doesn't know. I like to be sure. I'm so grateful. I anticipated a lonely retirement. Most of us do in the missions. Gillian Waller, under her breath. I thought I ought to ask someone in case it was troubling her, not being one of the family. You almost are. I'm sorry, Barbie. I don't know either. Come inside. It's probably of no significance. <laughs> Mabel. 
Mabel, it's Sarah. She's leaving for Calcutta. She's come to say goodbye. Hello, Auntie Mabel. When are you going, then? Tomorrow. In the morning. Where do you stay? I rang Aunt Fanny. She can put me up for a couple of nights. I thought they lived in Delhi. They moved to Calcutta in January. Uncle Arthur's got a new job. He's a colonel now. I wanted to ask you something as it happens. Something rather special. I wanted to ask you about an old christening gown. The christening gown? Yes. Well, you see... Oh, can you manage? Let me help. It was my mother's. If you want, Susan can have it. Well, no, it's for you to say. Butterflies. Caught in a web. Please take it. I've meant that you should have it one day. Oh, I am awfully grateful. So will Sue be. Things shouldn't be kept if they can't be used. It's yours anyway. It says so in my will. But take it now. This is the sort of country in which British and Indian forces have been fighting the Japanese in the Battle of Impal. Impal itself is the capital of the state of Manipur on the Burmese border and is one of our bases on this front. The Jap offensive here was really more of a defensive attack by which they hoped to spoil Allied plans for the recapture of Burma. Our forces, however, met the enemy thrusts, and there have been many of them, for in country like this there's no actual front line. Most of the first clashes occurred on the roads, where the Japs had tried to establish roadblocks. Our infantry and tanks, after heavy and difficult fighting, succeeded in driving back the enemy and reopening the roads. Miss Lee, for Captain Merrick, I'm Sister Pryor. Am I upsetting regular visitors? That's all right. We had a message from your uncle. Colonel Grace. Grace. He said you'd come a long way to visit us. I don't quite get the relationship. You are a relative, aren't you? No. Well, I thought it was odd. I'd always understood Captain Merrick had none, either at home or out here. He was the best man at my sister's wedding. He was wounded at the same time as her husband was killed. Oh, I'm sorry. Is your sister in Calcutta too? No, she's at home in Pancot. In the hills. She's expecting a baby. You have come a long way. I'm sure he'll be glad to see you, but I hope you won't find it necessary to ask him too many questions. We try not to let them dwell on things. I haven't come to ask questions, only to tell him how grateful we are for what he did. Captain Merrick was very brave. He's been recommended for a decoration. A medal? I suppose that serves some purpose. I never see what myself. I expect that shocks you with an uncle who's a colonel. My father's a colonel too, and it doesn't. I'll tell him you're here. Captain Merrick will see you now. Miss Leighton. Hello, Ronald. I've bought you some fruit. I hope that's all right. And some cigarettes. How's Susan? She's fine. 
She sent her love. Are you in Calcutta for long? No, I go back the day after tomorrow. To Pankart. Do smoke. There are some in the drawer. Mother sent her love, of course. And Aunt Fanny. She and Uncle Arthur are in Calcutta now. Can I light one for you? I'm afraid it involves rather more than that. I can't hold anything yet. These are rather damp, I'm afraid. So much nicer than Sister Pryor's. She's a bit of a dragon. A very pretty dragon. It's a good thing you came today. They've got other plans for me tomorrow. Surgery? Mm. What time are they doing it? Nine o'clock. If I rang about midday, I expect they'd tell me how it went. Yes, I'm, I'm sure they would. Then I'll do that. Thanks. Do you remember that evening when I came to say goodbye? Watching the fireflies? Waiting for them. Yes, I remember. I wanted to confess about the stone that hit the car. This time, it wasn't a stone, but it killed Teddy. And because of me. You're imagining that? No. You shouldn't talk about it. You don't get better by not facing it. I want to tell you. It began with a fellow called Mohammed Baksh. A jiff. You know about the jiffs, Indian soldiers who were once prisoners who turned coat to help the Japanese. Yes, but well, I've heard of them. There were a lot of them in the invasion through Imphal. Officers like Teddy took it to heart. They couldn't believe that Indian soldiers who'd served the army for generations would turn against them with the Japs. The regimental mystique. It goes deep. It was different for me. The GIFs were my special pigeon. I wanted prisoners. Prisoners who would talk. Teddy. Hated it. Terrified we'd find one who'd been in his regiment. An old, muzzy guide. And did you? He'd been captured by a patrol from one of the companies probing forward on our right flank. The brigadier gave Teddy and me the job of getting information from him. We found Mohammed Baksh, squatting on his hunkers under a tree. Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Teddy. Merrick, I heard you wanted to work. Been having problems. Well, I know Japanese, you see, but I'm a bit short on the air, Go, Ronnie. The usual questions. Uh, his name, his father's name, what his job was. He got confused and nervous. 
dancing at Teddy all the time. And suddenly I realised what he couldn't keep his eyes off was Teddy's cap badge. I said, Batch, you're an old soldier of this officer's regiment, aren't you? Pinner! <laughs> I don't believe him. I say he's lying. I know every sepoy who was with us in Burma. He's not one of ours. Come here, now, quick here, Batch. Malay on the captain's side. Ask him his CO's name. The man command officer can get up. Estin, sir. Estin. My God. An Indian? That's not right, surely. It is, you know. Hostile Sam is what they call Colonel Hastings. So. Here was proof. He told how he'd been captured by the Japanese and persuaded to join the Indian National Army. He said he and two other ex muzzy guide sepoys had managed to escape while their unit was pulling out of a village down the road, but had become separated. They must be hiding, scared to come out. But he gave their names. Aziz Khan and Farika Khan. Now he'd be shot, and he was glad. He deserved death for being disloyal to his uniform. He begged Teddy to shoot him there and then, but Teddy said, listen to me, Mohammed Pash. You're still a soldier. Act like You've done very wrong, but I am still your mother and your father. the old formula, man bap. Teddy believed it. He said, my name, my name Bingham. is Bingham. Yard record. Remember that. It was a sort of a pledge. I'm out of name Bingham. Yard record. I'm sorry. Do you think you could help me to a drink from that contraption? Teddy meant it, and Baksh trusted in that, only I didn't trust Baksh. I took the intelligence officer with me and went to have a word with his CO. I wasn't certain Baksh was telling the truth, that the GIFs and the Japanese had pulled out of the village and that it was safe for the company to move forward. I wanted to question him again, alone. But when we got back, Teddy had gone. So had Baksh, and the driver, and our jeep. The sergeant on mule line picket duty told us they'd driven off. They'd gone down the road towards the village to look for Baksh's companions, the other two jiffs. Teddy's gone off his head! Uh, the I.O. managed to grab a jeep and offered to drive me down the track. Did your jiffs try something on? I don't know, but I want them back! There they are. Stop! He's only taking a look-see. You won't find them there. We've patrolled all night. Aziz Khan! Fari Khan! I'll always remember them. Aziz Khan! The names, not the men. We never saw the men.
I hoped he wouldn't live. I couldn't do much for him. My left arm is numb. He died before they got to us. After dark. I never saw Baksh again. But I was right. He'd been lying. The Japs were there. Teddy believed him. I am your mother and your father. The old mystique. He wanted to prove that to me. That's why he was killed. You won't tell Susan, will you? No. And I don't want to hear. You haven't told me anything about yourself. What they've got to do. Oh, I'll be all right. In a few weeks, I'll be back on my feet. I suppose that's something. Susan's going to have a baby, isn't she? Teddy was very proud. He told others, not me. Not quite the sort of chap you tell that kind of thing to. She wonders if you'd like to be a godfather. How very kind. But under the circumstances, it wouldn't be quite right. Are you to be a godmother? Tell her I was touched and very grateful. Being there with Teddy when he died reminded me of something else. The last thing I did as DSP in Mayapur, a missionary teacher had committed suicide. Oh, do you mean Miss Crane? You knew her? No. But the woman who lives with Auntie Mabel used to be in the missions. She often talks about Edwina Crane. She locked herself in her garden shed and burnt herself to death. A symbolic act. She'd been attacked in the riots. She must have felt her India was dead, so like a good widow, she made a funeral pyre. I had to go along, poke about amongst her things. I found a picture of Queen Victoria sitting on an Indian throne, the jewel in the crown, waiting there with Teddy. It all seemed to connect. Victoria and the Raj. I am your mother and your father. Death by fire. And for a moment there, I fell for the idea of it. Devotion, sacrifice, a cause, a moral definition of what we're here for. People living in a world some sort of God created. The whole impossible, nonsensical dream. We shouldn't talk about it. Really, I can't... I'm sorry, Miss Layton. I'm told your uncle's come to fetch you. I'm afraid I'm going to turn you out. How are we? We are well. I'll say goodbye then, Ronald. I'll ring tomorrow before I leave. Well, tomorrow won't be at all a good day to ring us, will it, Captain Merrick? No, Sister Pryor, I suppose it won't. The day after. I shall be travelling back to Pancott the day after. I thought of ringing before I left. Oh, well, your uncle can keep in touch. I'm sorry to bustle you, but we have our little duties. 
I'll write to you from Pancott. Will you? Of course. Goodbye, Ronald. Marvellous, isn't he? You simply wouldn't know he's constantly in pain. He fights taking drugs. And it's all to the good he's not over-dependent. He'll come through tomorrow that much better. I am sorry, but we know nothing, and he wouldn't say. And you ought to know, oughtn't you? The left arm. The left arm? They took the hand off in Camilla. Tomorrow we have to take off from just above the elbow. The right arm's a mess too, but we can save that. His face will be scarred for life, but the hair will grow again, of course. He might even look human without the bandages. Bitch! You bloody, bloody bitch! Oh, there you are. Uncle Arthur. They said I should wait here. Have you heard the news? We've gone in. Landed in Normandy this morning and established a beachhead. The invasion. Your mother will be bucked. I'd lay odds on your father being out of prison camp and home for Christmas. We'll have a special drink to that. This is Major Clark. Only a captain when he was on my course a couple of months ago. My niece, Sarah Lee. How do you do? Be a good fellow and whistle up the driver for us, will you? Yes, of course. Decent of him to look us up on his way through town. He's coming round to the flat, so you'll be meeting him and some of my present lads. Uh, how's young what's his name? All right, considering. I rang your aunt for the dab down. She suggested I pick you up. She wondered if we ought to ring your mother. What for? Oh, just to make sure she's heard. Heard what? The good news, the invasion. I say, you're all right. Yes, thank you. It's these places. The smell gets in your tummy. Your aunt will set up at the bath and a drink. French rooftops over the bows of Allied landing craft to beaching on the Normandy shore. Tanks and heavy equipment are soon able to follow in the tracks of the first wave of assault troops. Round one of the invasion is one on points. Hitler's Atlantic wall has failed to stem the tide. This was going on while Britain breakfasted to the first news of the Allied landings. These pictures take a right in among the men who are putting Dunkirk into reverse, planting themselves on the first bit of French soil to be won back after four years. Stiffening of resistance was to be expected. A Bosch with his face bashed about a bit joins the gang of his fellow countrymen taken prisoner. Just a few chipped off Hitler's army of occupation for whom the invasion bell tolls. You are, Pet? Thank you, Aunt Fanny. Who? Oh, I bought nothing long. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's only Arthur's boys and hers. They'll probably take your dancing all to the tricks, so you won't need it in a gown. Now, tell me about poor Mr. Merrick. You may not want to hear much. They're cutting off his arm. Oh, no. When? Tomorrow. It seems he may be disfigured, too. He was badly burnt. But what did you say? I'm such a coward when it comes to anything like that. Other people's illnesses. It seems to strike me dumb. And for you, with him. Why? What's special about him? Well, Pet, you know the answer to that better than I do. It's you that came all the way down here to see him. Well, for Susan. Only for Susan? <laughs> yes. Why? Well, he was very attentive in Mirad. I thought you might be a bit gone on him. How could I be? He's not our class. 
Oh, that sort of thing doesn't matter like it used to, does it? A board schoolboy, Aunt Fenny. With a gentlemanly veneer and only one arm. Couldn't I do better than that? Oh, Sarah. I was only thinking about you being happy. None of that would matter if you really loved him. I don't know what people mean by love. And as a matter of fact, he appalls me. But thanks for worrying about me. Just don't, that's all. Oh, I've met men I've been attracted to. Some have been attracted back, that's simple enough. But love, if it's ever happened, I never knew. So it must be a bit of a sell. Then it never has. You've got it all to come. Isn't it wonderful about the news? If then your father gets home, I'm sure he'll be very proud, but awfully upset to know how little fun you've had. It's a shame you won't see more of Jimmy Clark except tonight. He's such a nice man. He's one of Arthur's most promising young chaps. And he went to your father's old school. He's only 30, but Arthur says he'll be a lieutenant colonel soon if the war goes on. Which it probably won't now. Incidentally, he's been asking all about you. Just finish making yourself look pretty and then we'll meet them. Have you boys decided how you're going to finish up the evening? There's Ingrid Bergman and Gary Cooper at the New Empire. Say not to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I've seen it, and it's rotten. Anyway, unless you've booked, there isn't a chance. Well, uh, think it over with the coffee. It won't be long. And neither shall we, shall we, Sarah? what they decide. Don't be put off if you bump into some cheeches. Boys like these from home think we treat girls like that awfully badly. And perhaps we do. But you're not like that, are you, Pat? Well, you'll have a lovely time. And there's safety in numbers. <laughs> Listen to me, birds and bees. I shan't start worrying about you until long after midnight, and Jimmy Clark will look after you. Be careful of the fair one. He's had a bit too much. I don't think we need to worry about him. Really? Heavens! How can you know about such things? <laughs> well, anyway, come on. Powder our noses and into the breach. My bet is that they'll plan for dancing at the Grand Hotel. <laughs> Over the fence sleeps Sunny Jim, forces the food that raises him. You remember that, Leonard? The breakfast stuff my nanny used to give it me. My nanny was the most wonderful person I ever lived. Was enormous. I worshipped her. Shut up, Tony. I knew she was very strict. That's a funny word, strict. Look, I only dance when there's plenty of room. So now's your chance. Aunt Finney tells me you went to Chillingborough. 
It's Daddy's old school. Yes, I know. I hope he survived the experience. Yes, I think so. Good. I survived it too. Have you been in India long? Uh, six months, but I'm off to Ceylon tomorrow. Aunt Fanny said you were in the desert. That's mostly a euphemism for Cairo, but yes. Now, shall I ask the questions and give you a rest? That fellow with us is going to be sick. That's why I asked him to dance now. He was all right at dinner. Not really. Look, when this dance is finished, will you do something for me? What? Go and powder your nose. I'll come for you in ten minutes after I've got rid of him. I don't mind him being a bit high. Yes, but I mind that he's not just high, he's over the edge. He'll probably end up crying. Or don't you think he's the crying type? I don't know. Well, I assure you that he is, so I'd be grateful if you do as I suggest. I thought I'd give it an extra five minutes. Well, I'm afraid ten was too many, so there's a change of plan. What do you mean, ten was too many? Well, he wouldn't budge, and his friend wasn't much help. I'm sorry. Anyway, this is a dreary place. I'll show you something better. Unless, of course, you want to go home. I mean, it's only uh, 10.30. You're not really telling me the truth, are you? You mean it isn't dreary? I mean about the others. I promised your aunt you'd come to no harm. Now, if we go back now, she'll think that I bored you, which isn't quite fair. Now, our taxi's ready, so shall we go? Where are we going? Across the so-called bridge. And uh, what does that mean? That's what you have to cross to reach the other side.
star, you see, this is the other side. Control telephone. The plane for Colombo leaves half an hour earlier than they said. Thanks, Mira. I brought somebody here, Piari. Her name's Sarah. Hello. Piari's in good form, hmm? He said they've asked for him at Government House. Did you hear? Will he go? He said only if you could take a bomb in his sit down. But why ruin a good instrument? So that's that. Mira's a stunner, isn't she? Yes, beautiful. She keeps her husband in drink, pays all his gambling debts and his mistress's clothes and jewelry accounts. Does she? Yeah. Why not? She's so rich she can't count it. Anyway, she likes his mistress. They were lovers. Mira has friends in Cairo. That's how I got to know this place. It's my unofficial address in Cal. Has Mira got friends in Salon? We both have. Then you'll be nice and comfortable. It is one of my aims in life. Isn't it yours? Yes, I suppose it must be. Well, that's refreshingly honest. That honor of the regiment exterior is paper thin, isn't it? Didn't the injection take? It's usually little. It's growing all the perfect kids in a sort of ghastly, non stop performance where rainbow ends. You escaped? I suppose how it looks. It's only half of the truth. What's the other half? No, last Christmas I was in Pindi staying with a friend of a friend who's been out here for years. We were tremendously polite. But I had nothing at all to say to him or his wife, two of the po-faced kids. They'd been trapped in some perpetual Edwardian sunlight. I felt I ought to say, come back, all is forgiven. Come back where? Forgiven by whom and for what? For what? Don't you know? This place is a gold mine, but it's stiff with people dying of hunger in the streets. That's the legacy from all those blue-eyed Bible thumpers who came out here because they couldn't stand the commercial pace back home. Now, I'll give another two years after the socialists have won the next election. I mean, who wants India as one of our post-war blooms? Are you a socialist? <laughs> Good Lord, no. I'm a low Tory, if you could call me anything. Why are you so sure the socialists would win an election? But Mr. Churchill's reputation can't for anything. Why do women always call him Mr. Churchill? It makes him sound like a vicar. So of course his name will count for everything patriotic and time expired. I don't suppose you've talked much to common British soldiers, have you? The fellows you refer to as BORs. I'll tell you what your BOR and Dulali or your daughter door salesman with Wingate in Burma thinks. He thinks, all right, mate, you're the officer, have it cushy while you can and duck when the shit flies. But when this stinking mess is sorted out, be a good lad and bugger off, out of my government and out of my bloody life, but forever. See, he thinks his own lot ought to run things because there are more of them. More than there are of la di da puffs, swigging brandy and getting hot for women that they don't know how to poke. Go. I'm quite a girl, Sarah Lane. No, I'm not quite a girl. I'm this one. And you're still a virgin, of course. Yes, I'm still a virgin, of course. Are you annoyed with me for asking, or because it's something you don't want to admit, or a bit of both? Hmm? In any case, clearly I must apologize. Mira is doing us proud. It's Lakshmi Kripalani. She sings, in case you didn't know. They're going to play again. I'd better show you where you can freshen up. That's a good idea. They, uh, they might go on for an hour. I'll keep this warm. Yes, thank you. There's probably everything you want. If not, 
not just ring. One of the girls will come. Thank you. You're going the wrong way. I'm over here. You do seem startled. Weren't you expecting me? No. Well, that's a pity. I thought you understood that we had an appointment. I mean, Mira did. So you mustn't worry about her absence causing comment. We had no appointment. Please turn on the light and open the door. Are you sure you want the door open? Yes. The key's here. Oh dear, have I miscalculated? I don't often, but it is an occupational hazard of the mail. You get a few more slaps than you deserve, but you also get screws, so you can't complain. Are you quite sure you don't want to lose that cherry? Quite sure. I'll give you one minute to unlock the door. You're not really plain. Quite pretty, really. In the buff, I expect your breasts look much more prominent. What I like best about you is you never say anything too obvious. That and your colonel's daughter, Guts. I brought up our drinks as well. Do you want yours? Not too much. Aunt Fanny told me that your mother drinks. It's embarrassing, isn't it? My father drinks a lot. What she should do is screw. I mean, that would be better for the Colonel, really, not to come home to an alcoholic who gets her screws out of bottles. Like your father? Yes, just like him. And what did your mother do for screws? Oh, mother was never hard up. She went in for handsome chauffeurs. Go on, you're doing very well. I hope you're not cross with Aunt Fanny, by the way. She was only trying to bring out my protective instincts. It's my fault she said too much. I realise that. Why are you shivering? Because I find it difficult to control myself. And you feel you must. What do you find difficult to control? Your temper? Yes. But now I'd be glad if you'd open the door. If the taxi's still here, I can go home without putting you to any trouble. If not, I'm afraid you'll have to organise one. And you don't want to lose that cherry. Very well. I like your Aunt Fanny. She's shallow. And I bet she was a scorcher as a girl. Potentially, you are worth 20 of her. But your brains and your toughness aren't worth a bag of peanuts if you lack joy. That's what Aunt Fenny's got, and you haven't. The place is stuffed with people who've thought so long that they've forgotten how to be happy, or people who've spent so long trying to be happy that they haven't had time to think. Aunt Fenny doesn't think at all. She wished you joy. That's all. And you don't want it. 
She's my Aunt Fenny, not yours. <laughs> my key for your Aunt Fenny. Catch. For Pete's sake, Sarah Layton, you don't know anything about joy at all, do you? No. No, I don't. I couldn't promise, love. You couldn't either, could you? And that's not right where you belong, except that you don't. Do you pretend because your father's away? Pretend that you belong for his sake? No. I do belong. That's what I know. That's the trouble. Please take your hand away. You really ought to bathe your eyes, you know. My Aunt Fanny would think the worst if she saw you now. Well then, shall we go, Sarah Layton? Is it so sad? Sarah, be joyful. Can't you sleep either? I was writing letters. Can I get you anything? No. Thank you, Barbie. There's nothing I want. I'm not sleepy, though. It's 
rather close, isn't it? Just a bit. <sighs> Perhaps you were thinking about the news. That's why I couldn't sleep. About the invasion. No, I was thinking it's a long time since I visited the grave. My husband's grave in Ranpore. Did I ever take you, Barbie? Don't go. Stay and talk to me. Talk? What about? Anything. About when you were young. I always enjoy that. Do you? Do you? Well, I was always a bit afraid of going upstairs to bed, so I used to hum a song my mother disapproved of. I've seen a deal of gaiety throughout my noisy life. Throughout what? Throughout my noisy life. Oh, one of your father's comic songs. Yes. He loved the music hall. He often promised to take me to it, but of course he never did. He was afraid of what my mother would say if she found out. And he was always a bit short of what he called the ready. One Christmas, he lost the presents for my stocking on the way home. I adored Christmas mornings. Waking in the dark, feeling the weight of the stocking on my toes. It was magic. I remember that. Even the quarrels in our house had a sort of magic. My life was never dull. You a dull man. Now, least of all, what do you think will happen when the war is over? Happen? Well, this house is much bigger than the Grace and Payer bungalow. If your stepson, if Colonel Layton is coming home, people are bound to think this was his father's house and that the bungalow's too small for Mildred, Sarah, Susan, and the baby. I know Mildred hates me because she thinks... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You must go to sleep. Yes, I will now. Thank you, Bobby. I'll see to the other light. Mabel. Yes. Who is Gillian Waller? Gillian Waller? Sometimes you say it in your sleep. Jillian Waller. Jillian Waller Bark. It's not a person, it's a place. The Amritsar Massacre in 1919 where General Dyer killed all those unarmed Indians. Was your husband there? He died in 1917. But you remember it? Yes. 26,000 pounds they raised for General Dyer when they retired him. I sent a hundred to the fund the Indians were raising for the families of their dead. There were more than 260 victims, you see. And 26,000 for him. So I thought a hundred was the price of one dead brown. It's not you, Barbie, and not this house. Jolly and Wallabar. I gave it to the Indians. That's what she can't forgive. A daughter of the regiment. I'm ready for the light now. Good night. India's Minister of Information says, we have trapped the enemy in the Imphal area. We must either withdraw or be annihilated. These pictures from the Assam Burma border take us into the hills of Manipur where men of the 5th and 7th Indian Divisions are in action. Japanese-held villages 
are consumed by flame as his attempt to seize our defensive base at his bar is thwarted. This is any man's country. Large opposing forces can wander for scores of miles without ever meeting each other. But when they meet, it becomes a matter. Japanese forces are soon quickly where they fell after being caught in a merciless crossfire from infantry and tanks. They have no further interest in Tojo Gamble. For them, it has meant death in a strange jungle 3,000 miles from Tokyo. Lovely here. Bye, Bobby. Aren't you awfully hot? You should be in the shade. I like the sun. Where are you off to now? Mr. Matrix. Where? The organist, I told you. He wants me to stick his volume of Bach together. It's all in pieces. Bach! I'll be back to dinner. Susan's here. When is Sarah coming back? Oh, she only went the day before yesterday. She booked a sleeper for tomorrow night. Goodbye, Barbara. Auntie Mabel. Auntie. Tell you it's gone. Double page. The F minor fugue. Here's where it should be. Sure, you've looked everywhere. Oh, what a pickle you're in. Mr. Maybrick, what are you standing on? What? <laughs> Eureka! Perseverance, my father used to say. Perseverance, Mr. Maybrick, wins the day. Angelic, Barbara. Ham fisted, but angelic. What would you say? Mutton, curry, and rice. I should say no. It was planned. Mutton, curry, and rice for two. Planned by whom? Loving me. By me. You've been overdoing the sherry. You've not done so badly yourself. Two glasses are all I've had. Refilled between fumes. You stayed to supper. You could start the binding afterwards. I shall do no such thing. You're becoming a hard woman, Barbie. I'm sorry. Oh, Arthur, Mr. Maybrick and I were just... Forgive me, Barbie. Mrs. Layton telephoned from Rose Cottage. Mr. 
I think we must believe she felt no pain. You're out a noisy life. No pain at all. Cottage. Kevin Coley speaking. Is Miss Batchelor with you? Oh, no, she's not here. She's not there. Well, I'm telephoning from Mr. Maybricks. I told Miss Batchelor of Mabel Layton's death and suggested she shall spend the night at my house. Well, she was distressed, of course, and anxious to go home at once. Mr. Maybrick and I were trying to persuade her. She retired for a few moments, and now we find she's disappeared. Gone? Well, frankly, Pedro, not convenient at all. Oh. Mystery resolved. Miss Bachelor's here. Yes, just arriving. Understood. Thanks for telephoning. Arthur Peplow on the phone seemed a bit concerned. I told Arthur I must get home at once. There's so much to do. Excuse me, Captain Coley. Bachelor. I won't get in anyone's way. No! No! Is that Susan? Dr. Travers is with her now. I think she may have started. If there's anything I can do. Thank you, but I think we can cope. Have you any idea where that bloody man can have got to? Which man, Mildred? Aziz. Aziz? Aziz was here. Well, he's not here now. And if and when he shows his face again, Kevin here has promised personally to boot him in the rear. But, but if he was worried, I don't think you understand Indians like Aziz at all. I understand only too well. I've asked Colonel Beams to have a word with the police. The police? Whatever are you saying? Not that there appears to be anything noticeably missing. Dr. Travis says Susan has started and wants you to help take her down to the car. No one really suspects Aziz. It's just a precaution till Beams is satisfied about the cause of death. The cause? He wanted a pathologist's report. Excuse me. Right as rain, you'll see. Miss Bachelor. Miss Bachelor Maybricks here. They've come to take you to the Peplos for the night. Mabel, would you mind telling me? 
General Hospital. Yeah. Colonel B was sort of divest. But it's all right. Mildred's there with Susan. I'm sure what you need is a good night's sleep. Have you transport? There's a rickshaw at the bottom. I left my bag somewhere. Oh, I have some receipts for bills I paid. I'll put them in Mabel's desk. Perhaps you'll see that Mildred gets these. Oh, of course. I'll pack some things. She'll go straight to the hospital. I must pay my last respects to Mabel, of course. I don't think that Captain Coley thinks that you... Captain Coley doesn't think at all. That's God's blessing. And I must speak to Colonel Beams at once. Just report now. It confirms my assumption of cerebral hemorrhage. It was done. Um, had she complained lately of feeling unwell? No. Not complained. I've told Mildred, uh, Mrs. Dayton Jr. No, uh, she's here with young Susan, as I expect, you know. I'm afraid from what Travis says, she's in for rather an arduous time. Fortunately. Captain Coley and Arthur Peplo have undertaken to make the arrangements for the funeral. There's a great deal to do. Do you know anything of the arrangements for transportation? I wish to accompany, of course. Transportation? The burial will be at St. Luke's in Rampur. She wished to be buried with her husband there. Hasn't Mildred mentioned this to you? No. I must see her and remind her. Are you sure those were the elder Mrs. Leighton's wishes? Quite sure. See? I'll mention it to her then. Well, I'm afraid I must leave now for Flagstaff House. But you can depend upon my letting her know. Are you accompanied? Mr. Maybrick is with me. Good. You must try to get a good night's rest. This must have been a greater shock for you than any of us. I wish to see her, of course. Can I do that now? I'm afraid not. But if you ring in the morning and ask to speak to Dr. Ayenega, I'm sure it could be arranged. Dr. Ayenega? Or his assistant. Extension 22. Uh, thank you, Colonel Beans. Brought the suitcase in. Safe over with the rickshaw. Why don't you go back to the back to the bungalow? Tell Clarissa and Arthur I'll be there in half an hour. Half an hour? I'll wait. Well, it may be longer. I shall ask. Colonel Beams will have run. I'm to see Dr. Ayanaga. Will you please tell him I'm here? Oh, but um, Dr. Ayanaga has left. Uh, then his assistant. Extension 22. Colonel Beebe should have rung before he left for Flagstaff House. See, I don't remember. It's Miss Bachelor, isn't it? Get Dr. Lau quickly, please. Dr. Lau will come to the telephone. Tell him I'm here in connection with the death of Mrs. Mabel Layton. As arranged by Colonel Beams, I'm to see him in his office. Doing for heaven's sake something I have to do. Dr. Lal? Yes. I am Dr. Lal. I was expecting to see Dr. Ayanaga, but I understand he's left. Yes, I'm sorry. Half an hour since. Some obvious lack of liaison upstairs. May we proceed at once, please? I'm sorry. Proceed with what? Identification. I have to see and identify the body of the late Mrs. Mabel Layton. I see. 
But no one mentioned to me this necessity. Are you a relative? Yes. One moment. Please sit. You should have waited. It is most you ready. I mean, nothing is ready yet. You come in without permission. It is not allowed. And now you are in a state. Please, please, you must sit somewhere and be patient. But why should I be blamed for this? No one will blame you, Dr. Love. I shall say nothing. It would be wise for you to say nothing, too. I have seen all I need. Forget I was ever here. But Dr. Ayanaga. He knows nothing. She is in torment. I've come to see Mrs. Layton. Uh, they told me downstairs to come up to number eight. Oh, I understood it was a Captain Coley with a message from Mr. Pepper. Oh, they got it slightly muddled. There is an urgent message from Mrs. Layton which concerns Captain Coley and Mr. Pepper. Yes, I see. And there, I've just told Mrs. Layton it was Captain Coley. Well, never mind. This way. How is her daughter Sue? Mrs. Bingham's just as well as can be expected. It's not going to be an easy delivery, I'm afraid. She's so tense. And Mrs. Layton's awfully anxious, too. Trying to get through to her other daughter in Calcutta. But I expect they're all out celebrating the Normandy invasion, which is what I'd be doing if we weren't short-staffed. Your visitor, Mrs. Layton. Come in, Kevin. Pour yourself a drink. It's on the dressing table and fresh in mind. There's an angel. What's happening? Oh, I got through to Calcutta, thank God. Sarah starts back tomorrow. Kevin? You bloody bitch. Mildred, please don't. It's not my fault if they got the message wrong. Do I look like Captain Coley? You can call me anything you like for what you think I've done, but you must listen to me first or she'll never rest. Never, never. I've seen her, so I know. She's in that terrible place, in anguish, because she thinks you've forgotten your promise or won't abide by it. She'll haunt me. She'll haunt you, all of us. I've no idea what you mean. What promise? To bury Mabel at St. Luke's in Rampur. What on earth are you talking about? It's what she wished. She told me. She must have told you. St. Luke's in Rampur. I know absolutely nothing about it, and it's quite out of the question. If you don't want the humiliation of being asked to leave by a member of the staff, you'd better go. Why is it out of the question? There's a telephone on that table there. All you have to do is to ring Arthur Peplow and tell him. Tell him this simple thing, that she wished to be buried with her husband. Arthur and I will do everything else that's necessary, but that must come from you. What you will do is leave this hospital at once and stop interfering. I find your suggestion utterly obscene. It's June. Perhaps you've noticed it's warm, even in Pancourt. I have no intention of having my husband's stepmother transported like a piece of refrigerated meat. Even if there were some indication in her will, I should have to override it. I know nothing about her will. But I do know about her will. I've had a copy of it ever since my husband went abroad. This gruesome little convoy you seem to think she wanted is quite out of character. After five years of living with her, I'm surprised you didn't know her better. On the other hand, I'm not. You were born with the soul of a parlour maid, and a parlour maid is what you've remained. India's been very bad for you. 
And Rose Cottage a disaster. I'd be glad if you'd be out of there by the end of the month. As soon as possible, in fact. If you've paid... Mildred! How dare you call me Mildred? To you, I'm Mrs. Layton. That's ridiculous. It's spiteful. Mildred is your given name, your Christian name. Christ! Uh, please! Oh. I'm sorry. Sorry. I am what you say. But I loved her so much. And I think God gave me this last chance to serve him through her. Please, Mildred! She asked for so little, but she did ask for this. Why should I make up a story? I'll do anything. Everything you say, but... Please don't bury her in the wrong grave. Not that. Not that. No, no. Oh. Now, I've told you. Need a little time to collect my things. Good night, Mildred. They've all gone now. These are for her. your mother. It's bad news. Aunt Mabel. I'm afraid she's dead. Miss Layton. I'm sorry, Miss Layton, but we're nearly there. We're coming into Ranpur. I'm sorry to disturb you. Oh, no. Thanks, Mrs. Ripper. Now, don't rush. We just thought you'd want plenty of time, because we only stay in Ranpur for ten minutes. Yes. I'll get done. Can you manage, dear? You've had a good long sleep. We nodded off, too. <laughs> You've been very kind. I'm afraid I was the most awful nuisance to you. Oh, my dear, not at all. Your uncle in Calcutta seems so concerned. <laughs> Let him share your coupe. 
And let him down the bunk as well. Now, just leave that. Directly we've had dinner, Mrs. Pennyman and I are going to tuck down. Is there anything we can do? You'll want some food at the station. No, really. But your train for Pancock doesn't leave till after midnight. Yes, I know. I think I'll just go and wash my face. Yes, freshen up. Perhaps she wants to be on her own for a bit. In the circumstances. I do hope there's something really Personally, I always find drinks famishing. <laughs> Tea in the dining car back home was best. Those little pots of jam, do you remember? And tea cakes. When we first came out, Roger's mother used to send us tim trees. They're from Falklands. It's the sort of thing that rarely counts. Though, in Burma, it was marvelous what we could get through no jams in Rangoon. I mean, Jim's special marmalade. I say, keep a lookout, Dorothy. I think we're here. I've got your curry for you. After 30 years of India, I can always spot the one you can trust. Well, there's only my case. Mensa Tasamana Lajaka Taira. Thank you. I can see some restaurant bearers down the platform. I hope one's got our trays. Bearer! Bearer! Goodbye, Mrs. Roper. Thanks for everything. Goodbye, dear. Mrs. Perriman. Shouldn't we find an escort for you? There must be at least one officer on the platform who could whistle up. Really, I should be quite all right. Surely you don't usually travel alone. Well, there's always a first time, isn't there?